Welcome to workshop three, Film Application and Environmental Sensing. This workshop will be uh, held by Pico Quant, which is represented by Fabian, uh, who will take over later. And uh, by myself, Astra Tannert, I'm from the Jena uh, Biophotonics and Imaging Laboratory, uh, which is this nice uh, thing, which is actually a joint cooperation between the Leibniz Institute for Photonic Technology uh, and the in a universal the hospital. And uh, we are doing not only fluorescence imaging, but also a lot of other things like uh, Raman microscopy uh, and uh, MALDI imaging and uh, other stuff. So in case you have any biological problem, which you all think we might be able to solve, please contact me. <laughs> but today uh, I want to show uh, you uh, FLIM, of course. Uh, and we choose uh, as environmental changes or as in environment we want to sense uh, the pH in uh, lysosomes. And I want to start with giving you some of the biological background. Now, okay. So um, lysosomes, as uh, when coming from biology, probably most of you will know, are small acidic compartments in eukaryotic cells, having a pH of uh, 4.5 to 5 in most cases. And their main function is that the digestion of extracellular and intracellular material, uh, which at least was uh, thought for a long time. But nowadays, uh, one realizes that uh, they have also a lot of other roles. And uh, also alterations in the pH of lysosomes may cause certain uh, pathophysiological conditions or uh, uh, at least in these conditions, alterations take place. And these include autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative disorders and age-related complications. What we also know now is uh, that uh, the pH of the lysosomes may be dependent on their subcellular localization. And we can induce uh, alterations in the pH uh, of cells by chemical stimulation of the cells, for instance, by the addition of ammonium chloride. This is the thing we want to do uh, during this workshop, which will increase the um, pH of the lysosomes. So the dye we are going to use uh, today is this one. Uh, we just published this uh, in Journal of Material Chemistry B, uh, which came out just a week ago. And uh, here you can see uh, the spectra of this dye. Uh, and what you can see at different pHs, uh, pH values, uh, what you can see is that not only the fluorescence lifetime depends on the pH, but also the spectra. Uh, so the absorbance and the fluorescence excitation spectrum are, of course, similar. And uh, this peak here, which is around 470 nanometer, is uh, more pronounced in the neutral pH, whereas when the um, pH decreases to the acidic uh, environment, um, we get two additional peaks over mm -hmm. here, which uh, are around 440 or 405 uh, nanometers, something like this. And also in the fluorescence emission spectrum, we see a pH dependent uh, second peak appearing here at about 440 nanometer, uh, only in the acidic uh, environment, while the main peak in the uh, neutral environment is uh, around 470 nanometer. So, of course, then you can think of resumetric imaging uh, by taking, for instance, the uh, excitation ratios here, uh, 458 to 405 nanometer, which are normally uh, available in confocal systems or uh, even at the peaks, the red lines, uh, which would be 462 to 413 nanometer. Uh, and you can see that if you uh, use this uh, ratios, you will get uh, almost linear dependency on the pH uh, of these ratios in the physiological relevant region of four to six uh, pH. And the same can be done for uh, the emission ratio um, by using these peaks, uh, taking this ratio, uh, we get uh, almost linear dependency in the, in the relevant region. So, but of course, you can also measure a time-resolved manner, uh, for instance, lifetime. These are time-resolved uh, spectral measurements every five uh, nanometer and uh, independence of the pH. And you see here in this curve that uh, the average um, fluorescence lifetime increases with increasing pH, which is uh, especially pronounced in this uh, lower wavelength excitation uh, emission range. 
the die localizes to lysosomes, as shown here in HeLa cells. Uh, so in green is our NMILS dye, which is a uh, naphthalene mono emit um, lysosomal marker. And in red is shown a commercial lyso uh, marker from Thermo Fisher, lysotracker red. And uh, the overlay shows uh, nice yellow uh, dots, which are more magnific magnified here. And you can see almost perfect co-localization, indicating that the dye indeed localizes to lysosomes. And the co-localization can also be um, shown in this uh, scatter plot. And we uh, get Pearson coefficients of co-localization co -localization between 0.75 and 0.9. So we also looked at the stability of the uh, dye within the cells and compared this to the commercial mm -hmm. tracker, which is in the lower panel. And here at two different excitation wavelengths, our dye. And um, we looked after, after different times after labeling at the dye, uh, if, uh, uh, how much the intensity decreases uh, due to, um, I don't know, uh, uh, metabolism of the dye. Uh, and of course, in all cases, uh, the intensity decreases over time. But uh, at uh, longer time points, uh, after one or two days, uh, as you can see here, uh, the commercial dye is almost uh, completely gone, while our dye is still uh, quite nice, visible, even though, of course, the intensity decreases. So this is uh, important if you want to uh, monitor longer uh, processes in, in the cells, for instance, what we are interested in, the uptake of bacteria into lysosomes and how they uh, uh, behave over time. So now we wanted to take the pH changes uh, with this dye. And uh, we first did this in a classical way uh, using resume matrix imaging, uh, in this case, excitation resume matrix imaging. So uh, we recorded uh, two uh, channels, one excited with uh, four or five, which is now shown in green, or we showed the overlay, but uh, it was colored in pure colored in green, and uh, the other one excited with 458 nanometer, which was pure colored in red. And uh, here's the overlay image before and after addition of ammonium chloride, and you see that uh, indeed after addition of ammonium chloride, the cells get a bit more red, but uh, it's 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 hard to see, uh, which was also quantified here. It was not too much. Uh, we also calculated the ratio, and the ratio increased a bit, but not too much. So in our hands, uh, excitation resumetric imaging is possible, but uh, the effects are not very pronounced. So and this was the reason why we went for phlegm. And uh, phlegm is more sensitive uh, and it is uh, also uh, independent of the concentration of the dye within the cell. Uh, yeah, and in this movie, you can see here, uh, this is the average lifetime uh, before and after addition of uh, ammonium chloride. So here is before and now we add ammonium chloride and you see that the average lifetime increases. And this is actually the thing I want to do with you uh, during this workshop now. Okay. Try to uh, stop this uh, movie. Uh, this, yeah. Okay. So actually, where is my... I had a movie here. Yeah, okay. So... What I want to go through to, uh, with you next is uh, how we prepare the sample. Uh, so we recorded beforehand a little video um, of the cell preparation. I just will start now. So because the voice uh, I was talking in was not so good, so I, I, I just will explain now uh, what I, I am doing here. So this is actually the medium we are using. So the HeLa cells were grown in uh, the, uh, the Piekus modified eagle medium uh, supplemented with 10% FCS. Um, and uh, I am now going to prepare a labeling solution for the cells. And for this, uh, we use uh, also kind of uh, the Piekus modified eagle medium, but uh, in this case, um, supplemented, um, uh, in this case, it's, it's um, uh, the fluoride uh, DMEM from GIPCO. And this is also supplemented with 10% uh, FCS and some antibiotics to prevent some bacterial growth uh, when we take this out of the bench. So this is actually the dye we got from our cooperation partner from the organic chemistry department. Uh, it is dissolved in DMSO in the beginning at the concentration of uh, 10 millimolar. I will now uh, dilute it into um, 
our uh, our uh, medium just to put it into the cells. So uh, the final concentration for labeling will be uh, 500 nanomolar. Uh, I would recommend to uh, do not use higher concentrations of this dyes because then it will uh, get some kind of self quenched into the cells and we will get some fancy effects. So best concentration to use will be 100 uh, to 500 nanomolar. We also tried five micromolar, which gives really bright uh, cells, but uh, also we get a lot of artifacts then. But probably this has also be uh, to be found out for every cell line to use. So I will make a dilution uh, of the dye, which is actually a one in twenty thousand dilution now. Vortex this uh, properly, as shown here, and uh, then we can put this onto the cells. So the cells have been uh, grown before in a six wear plate on this round cover slips um, in, in the normal uh, growing medium. And uh, these are uh, normal cover slips, uh, 1.5 cover slips, of course. And uh, I will just add uh, the solution we pre uh, prepared before now to the cells. take off the medium. And now I will uh, add uh, two uh, milliliter of the prepared solution to every well. And this can done for uh, many wells beforehand, because as I showed you in the PowerPoint before, uh, the dye is quite stable, so uh, you can do the labeling for all the cells you want to uh, image in the morning and then use it the day or even the next day. So now this goes into the incubator for uh, half an hour. And after this half an hour, we will remove the labeling solution just to avoid uh, that uh, more dye is taken up and to get some fancy artifacts. And now I will wash uh, the medium away or the labeling solution uh, by washing twice with uh, two milliliter per well of uh, PBS. Just to avoid that there is uh, still some medium present. So do you take special care about the number of cells that you seed in the well or is that um, independent? To be honest, uh, I never count <laughs> because I'm a bit lazy, uh, but uh, I have my experience so that um, the cells are not, not so thick so that uh, we will be able to, uh, to see single cells and that they, that they are not overgrown. So um, yeah, but uh, I should look up the concentration I get because it's it's almost uh, I, I always use a one in ten uh, con uh, dilution of my uh, trypsinated cells so it's uh, more or less always the same but um, I, I don't really count them and it's 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 not that important uh, at least for this experiment mm -hmm. of course if you are doing some bacterial infection you have to count the cells because then you have to know uh, how many uh, bacteria you will put per, per cell to infect uh, something we ca uh, call the uh, MOI uh, the multiplicity of infection, so how many bacteria will go per cell, then you count, but but not for, for such experiments. 
uh, I guess uh, it's 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 important that uh, the medium uh, to die will be uh, that there will be enough to die in the solution if you supply the two uh, ml and uh, if you would incubate longer they would take up even more of the dye. So it's not that if you have more more, more cells that you uh, the cells uh, get less quiet. Mm -hmm. So. And after I have washed the cells now, I will add uh, two milliliter of uh, fluoride medium with FCS, <clears throat> which I'm doing right now, I guess. <laughs> and uh, then the cells can go back into the incubator until uh, they will be used uh, for the imaging. <clears throat> okay, and that's actually uh, now I want to image something. So I take off the cells from the incubator and I have this nice uh, chamber to uh, put the cover slips in. And I try to take out one of the cover slips here. So the top side should still be in the top side in the chamber. That's important because on the top side the cells are, and we will image with an inverse microscope from below. So I carefully adjust it uh, now, the cover slip in the chamber. Close the chamber, that's kind of a magnetic, it's, it's a commercial laptic chamber, which is quite nice. Uh, and now I will add uh, one milliliter of the medium to this chamber. And what's important now is to um, to clean the, the lower surface of the cover slip to, to, to try it because there will be some, some remaining of the medium which uh, will not be good for imaging. We are using oil uh, immersion objective, so uh, cover slip should be really dry. So I guess that's it. Um, we also have a movie how I put it into the microscope. Um, Maybe we can show um, now or later, Fabian, what do you think? No, we can just show it now. Yeah. With, um, oops, something's wrong here. Just try again, sorry. <laughs> So this is our, our system where I'm actually sitting right now. Uh, and uh, it has incubation chamber, uh, which I heated before to 37 degrees Celsius. And we use a 30, 63X uh, oil immersion objective. I uh, just put the oil onto the uh, objective. And now I take off uh, the sample from the transport chamber here, because uh, uh, we are all in the S2 area for generate genetic engineering, everything has to be a bit safe. Clean this once again. And place yeah. it in the in, in the microscope. Astrid, there is just like maybe one quick question from uh, yes. Hella. Yeah. Uh, do you use the 37 degree oil or the normal immersion oil F or Imersol? Imersol F. I, I, I use the normal Imersol F. I only learned uh, some time ago because somebody else asked me exactly the same question that there is a 37 degree oil. So uh, I guess not size, even, uh, even though they sell me the incubation chamber, they never told me about the special oil. So I don't. I have never tested the other oil, but uh, we get quite nice results with the normal oil. I don't know if, if anybody else can comment on this, uh, ever has tested the other oil. But in, in my hands, uh, the normal oil is working fine. 37 degrees says I, I always use it with incubation and we, we do a lot with incubation. Also uh, other things. Yeah. 
And uh, maybe like when we do start the measurement, you can, I'm not sure if you can look up uh, where do you get the magnetic chambers from quite, quite quickly. Uh, I think yeah. they are from LabTech. Uh, uh, I can't, yeah. can't look up uh, now because it was, uh, I would have to go upstairs, but I'm pretty sure that they are from LabTech. Uh, uh, no, um, sorry, from Picon, from Picon, who also provides the, um, the incubation chamber. But uh, yeah, so actually, uh, the thing uh, where, where, where they were supplied is, is, is uh, two, three floors above me now, so I can't just <laughs> have a look right now. Okay, I will now stop screen sharing here and try to share my other screen. Maybe I can just very oh, you, quickly, you, you, can, you yeah. can set up, set up everything. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, told something about the, the system that we would, that we are using actually. So we do work here with the uh, LSM from Zeiss, the LSM 980. So it's like the, the newest uh, generation, let's say. And uh, with uh, also the newest yeah, generation from, from PicoQuant. So um, like, um, like with the group from, from Cast Grassoff, uh, we do have here also a Flim plugin in ZenBlue, which is now the software for the LSM 980. And we do have here also uh, a motorized uh, laser combining unit. So meaning that, that you will see like uh, later that we do have uh, full laser control directly in, in ZenBlue. So full laser control of the PicoQuant lasers. Um, exactly. And here at the system, we do have uh, in principle two PMA hybrid detectors, which do have uh, a reasonable good quantum efficiency and also no dead time. And they can work with a high count rate. And we do have here also one uh, infrared sensitive detector. So uh, an exilita spot detector, which has like the yeah, best performance, let's say in the red range. So at 700 nanometer, for example. Um, and yeah, beside that we do have here like a 440 nanometer laser for 70, 560 and 640 and all of them are pulsed from PicoQuant. And uh, we do have you also like the newest, yeah, TCSPC electronic, the, which can work with these high count rates uh, regimes. Yeah, and this way with uh, Asco just uh, moved in the screen, that is the Flim plugin, but that I will like explain later on a little bit more. Okay, shall I take over and find a suitable cell for imaging then? Yes. Okay, I, 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 I've tried before, so um, actually I, I'm going to use uh, the PicoQuant lasers also for finding the sample right now within the uh, size software. So we have this plug-in here, which is the handshake between the uh, PicoQuant software, uh, SymphoTime 64 and the size software, SimBlue. And uh, with this software, we can uh, control also uh, the lasers of the PicoQuant software or with the Sendshake software. So I will switch on the 442 uh, nanometer laser, which we are going to use for imaging. I will set the intensity for 100% here. And for, I guess, 68 is a bit low. I tried before, so I will put this to 80%. Um, and also the repetition rate can be set here. So we are going to use, um, 26.6 uh, uh, megahertz, so I will put 27 megahertz, and this will uh, put the right uh, intensity in the simple time. Yeah, and just to take it over, I will just press the test button here. And then all the settings should be on. So at the moment, you won't see anything in the PicoCon software because we are still with the beam splitter on the size uh, uh, software. So now I'll 
will lead you a bit through the size software. So we have this locate button, which is uh, only for finding the cells. Uh, so I've done this before. So now we are in the acquisition hub. And here's our imaging setup. Um, so I have now a, a size detector here, which is a gas detector. Uh, and I will detect fluorescence on the size detector in a range of 443 to 640 nanometers. And we also have a bright fit detection on, which is indicated here. So uh, at the moment, we are not zoomed in. We have a frame size of 512 times 512 pixels. And what is important for film imaging, imaging is that we do unidirectional imaging, even though it takes longer, but uh, I think the PicoPan software can't deal with the bidirectional imaging. So here you can set the gain of the channels. This is just for, for looking and finding a nice uh, sample here. So this is actually the gain of, your, uh, of the detector. And yeah. I think that's it. I would now go for the um, continuous mode. Uh, I will adjust the focus a bit. Just to find cells. It's not allowing me to make this you know, a bit, bit bigger. So at the moment, we are uh, um, having the PicoQuant software and the size software for the reason of this workshop at one computer, which makes uh, everything a bit uh, crowded. But uh, this also enables you to see uh, both the PicoQuant software and the size software in the normal system. We have them on two computers and two monitors. So I will now just move the sample. And you see here the labeled cells. We reset the range event, so and now we we'll look for a cell which we can image. You see this uh, bright dots, these are the lysosomes, so the labeling is quite okay. And normally, what I would do now is to uh, define uh, with the definite focus uh, two from size to keep the, um, the surface. Uh, but unfortunately, for some reason, I don't know, today the definite focus is not working together with me. So we have to, to hope that the focus will not drift away too much during measurement. Actually, I will take off this thing before. Maybe at the moment, at, at that time, I can just like answer the question from Lucas. Yeah. Um, so, what is definitely correct is that you should not change the electrical laser power between experiments or within one experiment, let's say. Yeah, so uh, it is okay to change the electrical power, laser power, because the electrical laser power, changing this electrical laser power, so not the attenuator, will lead to a change in the pulse shape of the pulse laser. Um, and thereby, it will also lead to a, to a different uh, instrument response function. So, but it is okay to change this electrical power when to, to, to find like the optimum setup for your experiment. But when you once found that, you should not change it. Yeah? You should not measure uh, on Monday with 70% laser power, electrical laser power, and on Tuesday with 80 the same cells. That will not work. Okay, so I think I would try to image this cell. It looks quite nice to me just to show you before. Here, uh, this is the objective we are using. Um, we are working at 37 degrees Celsius as shown here. And normally I would have uh, also definite focus on, but for some reason it's not working today. Okay, so what I will do now is to uh, zoom in into the cell and we have this nice crop function uh, in the size software. So I will take this, put it on top of the cell, reduce the size a bit, and also reduce, make a rectangular uh, region, not a quadratic, so just to save time for the imaging. Uh, what we have now, we are sampling almost confocal here. 
We have 512 times 297 uh, pixels. Uh, let's hope that we don't have too much bleaching today uh, uh, that we will see during the measurement. Yeah, I will set up a time series, so I will make an, uh, another snap first. Sample looks still okay. So what we will do then is a time series because uh, I want uh, to make, um, to, to see how the ammonium chloride is working. So for this reason, we will image some, some, some frames uh, before um, we add the ammonium chloride just to see that we have a, a stable baseline. Normally I take uh, five images before addition of ammonium chloride and then I add ammonium chloride and um, see how the lifetime will change. And uh, the time series, uh, so I will make an image every two minutes now, I guess. Or shall we make it every minute? No, let's, let's do it every two minutes. And after um, five images, um, or let's, let's do it after every minute, if not, it's too, too long. So, uh, and then we uh, make a duration of 20 cycles. So it's a total time of 20 uh, minutes in which we are very happy to answer all your questions which you can uh, post in the Zoom. Uh, and um, after the first five minutes, after the first five cycles, I will add some ammonium chloride into, uh, into the, uh, the valve where the cells are, and this will hopefully change the pH. So uh, Fabian, do you want to take over or shall I start the measurement? Just like... oh, you, can, you can just like start the measurement and then uh, I explain our software. Okay, so uh, what we can put in here is to give a group name like NME, NMI, LS, ammonium, chloride, and then an actual file name, uh, which is like um, measurement first, for instance. Um, so it didn't take, it still has 10 cycles in here for some reason, or oh, it has 20, okay. So um, laser power is like here. Um, so uh, we will say it should stop after a certain time. So to give me some time to uh, pipette ammonium fluid in, I would uh, rather have uh, sampling for 40 seconds. Uh, then uh, I have 20 seconds uh, in between to uh, open uh, this um, microscope chamber and uh, uh, pipe the ammonium fluid inside before the next uh, frame will start. Okay, um, so we have in the uh, simple time, we have this workspace open. That's important because uh, if there is no workspace open, uh, uh, it can't save data, but I will do a test measurement first. Ah, I forget something because still we are detecting on the uh, size detector, but of course we have to go to the pico quant detector now. So what we have to do uh, to go to the pico quant detector to take this mirror off here in the size software and replace it either by a plate or in this case we can also use a long pass uh, filter with 460 nanometer. So everything above 460 nanometer, all the emission will now go uh, onto um, the pico quant uh, detectors. So. so what you see here also, so sensitive yeah, just yeah. started. So I will start the measurement now and so, yeah, and, and here, yeah, and, and when you remember the last uh, work, workshop uh, session uh, from, from Karsten Grassoff and the question that, that raised up there is, here you see exactly what happens when you do have this um, peak, these bright spots in the image. And they, at, at some point at the beginning, uh, they were like very, very bright and they um, extend this 10% of the repetition rate, uh, which is like at this time, uh, 2.7 mega counts. 
And because we had a repetition rate of uh, 2.27 uh, uh, megahertz. And so what you see here, uh, ah, okay, first frame finished. So I can I think choose. we have quite a lot of bleaching today, but. Um. So um, I want to just like add here some contrast. Hello. I can increase this one. Here. Um, so, okay, what, what do you see here? What, what kind of information you have? You have here on the one side in the software, um, the number of counts, um, and here it can like increase the contrast. And then you have like also the lifetime information yeah, because the image is always um, built up from or the brightness is depending on the number of counts and the color code is dependent on the average lifetime information. And, um, and that's why, that, that's how you get this color coding. You see here also the lifetime decay and like the time trace. And um, yeah, here then you see that we do have our workspace and time point one, position one. Um, this is like how, it, how it's like the, the um, how it's numbered, let's say. So T1, T2, T3, and so on and so forth. So that you know exactly on the next day, okay, good, what, uh, did I measure the day before? Um, also, beside like um, the information, let's see here. So, what is also transferred to the PicoCon software is like the acquisition information yeah, on the of the Zeiss uh, software. So, the uh, the number of pixels, yeah, the the image ratio, let's say, the spatial resolution, the pixel dwell time, the, num the time of one frame, which objective is used, and also the major dichroic. All that information is also transferred to the SymphoTime software through the uh, plugin, so that even the user does yeah, even you like not open the size software, you still have this information in our software. Uh, yeah, which is like important for reproducibility. And um, also what comes up, so what, uh, what do you mean by time trace? Time trace is basically like the intensity time trace or count, count time trace. So the counts over time. Let's say that's, yeah, that's what, what I mean like by time trace. Um, and exactly here in this time, it, it works that uh, the PicoQuant and the Zeiss computer does run on one PC. Yeah, um, this is normally, let's say not the case because our software requires for data analysis um, nearly workstation characteristics. So meaning uh, our PCs do normally come with 128 gigabyte of RAM, uh, which is like required for data analysis. Um, but here, because of uh, this webinar, we did like, yeah, hack uh, the, the Zeiss PC and add our software on the Zeiss PC. So in principle, it is possible to run both uh, through one PC. Um, the question that, that comes up, for example, is, okay, if we do use Ariscan and then do reconvolution when the Zeiss software does need a lot of power, uh, if that is still like enough. Um, Maybe ask one question for you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gerhard uh, just uh, asked a question right at the beginning. Yes. Uh, did you like calibrate the pH value depending on the lifetime at some point? We tried um, to do this uh, with, with the buffer, but in our hands, the lifetime in the buffer is not exactly the same as in the cells. This is probably because uh, in the cells, we have a lot of other factors um, uh, on other environmental things. So it's it's much more complex than in the buffer. So in our hands, the lifetime in the cells is a bit lower than in, in, in the pure buffer solution. So uh, it, it, it's hard. We, we, we really didn't find a way to calibrate it. Hmm. Okay, I, uh, just just because I was just talking, uh, I just added the ammonium chloride uh, now. So I guess we had uh, we, we should have used a bit lower laser power because we have quite a lot of bleaching effect here. But yeah, maybe we can see the effect anyway. We can see the effect in the recorded image which we are going yeah. to analyze later. Uh, so shall I uh, show the movie of the of the addition of the ammonium chloride or? Yeah, you can just like briefly uh, show that. Yeah. I will stop screen sharing here for brief and show this from the other. Um, so um, there was also the question from Niels, um, the difference between intensity and power percentages in the handshake laser control. So when I just move back to the acquisition panel, exactly. So intensity in our laser combining unit we do have uh, a motorized uh, OD filter wheel, a continuous OD filter wheel, and that changes the uh, laser intensity. Yeah, now we do use an OD filter wheel, wheel because this does not affect uh, the, uh, the pulse shape. And uh, the power that is really like the electrical power that comes from the laser driver uh, to the laser head. And this will change the pulse width. And um, yeah, that's like the difference between both namings, let's say. This is just briefly that you get an impression how I add the ammonium chloride. So I will switch on the light within the system because that's easier. And then I uh, just have to be, make sure that I switch off the light before the uh, next frame is acquired. Yeah, that's it. It's very brief. So uh, combination of Aries scan and FLIM is uh, not possible because the Aries scan detector is, is like no yeah, it does not have like the photon counting mode, let's say. Now, like when you, when you are familiar with the big two detectors from Zeiss, they do have, for example, a photon counting mode. Um, and then you can have like the in, in intensity image uh, visible in the Zeiss software and in parallel, the lifetime image uh, in, the, in the PicoCon software and that. But that is, uh, yeah, not the case for the for the Aries scan, and yeah, there were also like the next question: spatial resolution of film the same as Aries scan? Uh, also, there, yeah, this is this is not the case. Now, although when you do have a look like at film thread, of course, the spatial resolution of film thread is way higher than the Aries scan uh, when you when you in terms of interaction compared to colocalization. I think also there's some some kind of drift. But. Yeah, I just try to readjust the focus a bit. But, uh, yeah, maybe next frame will be better. Because at this frame I was playing around a bit. So we, we are now seeing here two effects. One effect is, of course, the bleaching because we use quite high layers of power uh, just to, uh, to, to uh, enable uh, short acquisition times. And uh, the other effect is also uh, the one of the ammonium chloride um, because uh, when we add the ammonium chloride, the pH of the lysosomes will increase. 
and this will result uh, in a drop in of intensity of, of our dye and also probably uh, uh, the, um, the disappearance of some of the lysosomes. So uh, it's normal that after addition of ammonium chloride, uh, the cells get uh, less uh, bright intensi uh, intensities, but uh, it, we also have the bleaching effect. That's why we have, uh, it's now hard to see anything. Good. Um, yeah, and then Thomas, uh, you're, you're completely right. Um, you can do a correlative. Yeah, afterwards you can also like export the lifetime image as a um, yeah bin or or um, a bitmap file and or, or uh, TIFF, and then you can also um, yeah reload it into into Zen Blue, and then you can also um, overlay both, for example. So there's the question, is it advisable to take an image of only one cell at a time? So that is at the end, let's say, um, time relevant, acquisition time relevant, let's say. so. Uh, when you do have fast processes, for example, you want to take the acquisition time per frame as low as possible. And therefore you want to have like a, a smaller region of interest to image faster, yeah? because the lower the number of pixels is, the faster the scanner can go. Um, but if you want to do um, yeah, image multiple cells to, let's say, uh, compare those. Um, of course, then the larger field of view might be of more interest. Maybe oh. I can add here, um, yeah. of course, uh, uh, if you want to uh, um, make statistics over many cells, it's more advisable uh, to, to have more cells in a field of view. Uh, but then, of course, uh, when you want to go to the same acquisition speed, uh, you can do this, uh, but then you will lose spatial resolution. You can also uh, image a big field of view with only 512 times 512 pixels or something like this. Uh, and then you will get uh, probably less bleaching, but uh, then you will lose the spatial resolution and probably won't um, recognize the lysosomes as, as, as good anymore as they are. But this is also a uh, always a compromise uh, depending on, on, on the spatial resolution you require and uh, yeah. uh, what, what, what your cells can give you and uh, yeah. what, what you are really interested in. I saw there also was a, a, a more, more or less biological question. Uh, is this dye specific uh, or could you as well add the sequence uh, of choice to target other organelles? Um, this dye is specific for lysosomes, but of course uh, we could ask, our, so, so, so the dye co comes from our cooperation partners in the organic chemistry department, uh, the group of Kalinda Peneva in Jena. Uh, they could of course uh, have a similar um, naturally monoimide based dye, uh, which is targeted to another organelle, we just uh, would have to ask them to design something. Ah, okay, because... So there is only, so the question is, is, is this now only the detector from PicoQuant or is it both detectors from Zeiss and PicoQuant work simultaneously? So um, what you see in the Zeiss software is basically the uh, transmission detector. And um, this is, yeah, just like, like scatter light, let's say. Uh, and on our software, you, do you see only uh, the signal from the picoquant detector. Uh, but, but like you like uh, shown in the Zeiss software, uh, you can later on overlay 
uh, the picoquant image with the uh, DIC or, or transmission image. There was also a question about uh, the use of this dye in live animals or 3D organoids. We have never tested live animals so far. Uh, might be possible, but we have, we have ne never tested. And the same is true for 3D organites. But I, I guess it's it's more easy to get it into the 3D organites. Um, should be small enough to diffuse inside, but but we've never tested so far. So we've only only worked so far with with uh, cells, cell lines. I think Fabian, we might stop this measurement here because the cells uh, trying to escape anyway. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, we can do that. Yeah, let's stop it. So, in case uh, you will see that uh, you want to stop your measurement before the time series is over from the size of it, just press the stop button and everything is fine. Yeah, and then our, our software stopped also immediately. Um, So we can we can just maybe quickly. Maybe I, I will reduce the size two, software three, a bit. Then you have more four, space for the pickle five, one software now. Six, seven, eight, nine. So I'll, I go probably now just for the first ten frames. One, two, three. That's not here. Time point. Ah, time point. Ten. So one till ten. And we click on analysis. So what I basically do now for, for all that uh, from you who did not join 10 minutes before the session is actually I'm controlling through Berlin via TeamViewer the PC in Jena. Um, and what I basically did now is I, I opened the group flim uh, analysis, which is like written for uh, time lapse or, or also, um, yeah, time, yeah, for, for time lapse experiments or uh, multi position or, or Z time lapse or Z stacks. Yeah. I mean, uh, just uh, one question here. Maybe I can answer it before. Do you observe shifting often? Uh, I mean, drift in XY. So what we have been observing right now was not a drift of the sample, I guess, but it's lifestyle imaging we are doing. And this cell uh, didn't like to be imaged. <laughs> so it was a bit shy and or was just moving out of the field of view. Uh, so uh, that yeah, we see sometimes that the cells move around. We sometimes even can, can, can uh, measure that the cells divide and so on. Uh, maybe it would have been more lucky to uh, image a, a bigger field of you than we could observe more than cells. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I just did, uh, because we do only have a look at the detection channel one, uh, I just selected the data from detection channel one and uh, I bin now uh, the pixels by two and yeah, just like to, to speed up a little bit. And I want to have a look at the average lifetime from one to five uh, nanoseconds. And what you see here directly is uh, you do have quite a low um, lifetime in the lysosomes. And when I now have a look, so this is frame four. Yeah, it's still low. I'm gonna now have a look at frame six. All oh, this bluish is gone and we go more into greenish. Um, also, we have you like a little shift in, in Z. You still see the lysosomes and you also still see there is no bluish uh, color uh, anymore. And what I can do now, I can also set up here these lifetime histogram, which you see on the right side. And now here it goes from zero to 100, yeah, but that 
is not important for us. And when I now just show you some, and maybe we just go go on five, four, let's skip this one. I see, you see that, that it is like slightly shifting to right, but I can like, it will be more prominent after the pitting. So let me just show this one. And okay, what I do now is just, I use a region of interest and I just, yeah, choose the region of interest by, by applying a threshold. Yes, so. And what I basically now do, I just remove all see that is already quite nice and so when i do have now a look at image 10 okay there we are go to six yeah for example image six i still have my lysosomes uh, selected uh, a little bit of the background or or, or of the cytoplasm um, but the lysosomes are way brighter, though, so that should be okay in this case. So click on okay, and then this is like, it's automatically applying the threshold to all images. And you see directly, okay, good, what is selected in the frames. So what I do now is just like I fit now my region of interest. Uh, maybe I can get this one. Get rid of this one. Fabian, shall we record an IRF anyway? Uh, yeah, we can do that later on. Okay. So what you, what you basically do is when you do have um, like um, not yet any idea about your, your floor four, yeah? The first thing what you do is basically, okay, good. You do check uh, how many life components do um, mirror or, or do um, uh, to represent uh, the lifetime decay. And you see here by the residuals, by the chi-square also, by the residuals, you see directly that these are not equally distributed around zero. And therefore we do have like to increase it to two components. And you see that this is like immediately way better. At the beginning, we do have here, like it's based, this is like basically a shift of the calculated uh, instrument response function uh, and our, our true decay. But the chi-square is here already like around 1.5. What I do then is I do fit, uh, all region of interest. So all these 10 DKs I do fit now. And then what I want to see is like a change in the, in the lifetime. Yes, 
Yeah, Stefan uh, just asked, like, the signal decreases that bleaching or some biological reaction? Yeah, and it is... Both. Uh, both. In this case. So I just try to answer. Um, normally, if, if, if we adjust uh, laser power that we have uh, almost no bleaching, we will see still a decrease uh, due to the addition of ammonium chloride. But then we would have the first fi uh, five frames with virtually the same intensity and uh, then uh, a decrease... Uh, uh, later on uh, after the addition of the ammonium chloride. I, I guess uh, maybe we should, for, for the analysis, go to one of the recorded uh, things, which is represented much better, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, just let's see. But yeah, we, do, we should definitely like, uh, so get rid of no. Yeah, so I, I will go to, to the recording uh, once they do see like a way clearer uh, increase in the lifetime because here we do have like really too, too much of, of bleaching, let's say. Um, so what I will do is I will share my screen. Should I stop sharing here? Let's see if I can just like, yeah. what's up now? Hello. So the question is, have you used a fixed threshold for all time points or is it calculated? A threshold for each frame? Could the latter be problematic? Um, so what I did is I used uh, one threshold and apply that threshold to all frames. Um, in this case, that was basically just like to get rid of dark pixels uh, and, and like pixels that you that do not um, reflect the, the lysosomes, which were much brighter. So, so I agree, uh, if the bleaching is, is, is as much as it was in this experiment, this might be problematic, but normally it's not, because we just apply the threshold so that, that the background is gone. And exactly, the, yeah. the lysosomes are much, much brighter. Yeah, and, and like here, in, this, in the example that I uh, will show you, and here we do have, like again, the, the slim analysis, uh, we do have on the one side a larger region, uh, which, and maybe because that's why we do have also maybe less uh, bleaching, because the cells do have more time to relax, let's say. And I also used uh, a different. Uh, way of uh, selecting my region of interest. And I was uh, just like drawing a region of interest um, around around the cells, let's say. And to, to make them visible or whatever, I, I like quite, um, make it quite bright. Let's say now again, I just like uh, adjust the contrast This is just like some some yeah denoising. And uh, I can I can like not not this as you see like this is also recorded because I do have to use therefore like workstation and I cannot do that analysis with my laptop, which is like just connected. Um, so exactly now, basically I draw the region of interest around the, around the cells. And here you see green, green, and now it's getting orange or yellow. And that was also to double check that the cells did not move too much. 
And because I, what I want to do is now also, again, I want to apply one region of interest uh, to all uh, the measurements. And uh, later on, you can export those as, as a bitmap file. And I think that allows you also to export it as a movie. So actually the movie I've shown before, I just uh, used the, all the bitmap files of all the uh, time series points and uh, just made the movie out of it. Yeah. Different software. That's yeah, that's also straightforward normally. Yeah, this is just for example, for example, like the so-called tail fit. Uh, maybe I just come on, ten seconds that's too much. And, it, and the tail fit is called tail fit because it just takes not the complete decay into account. It, it, it starts after the peak of the decay. So it might be that like very, very short lifetimes may be rejected. Uh, or when you have like, it, it is like when you have multiple components and one is, when you do have like one very fast component in your floor of four, it might be that you do have like this drop at the decay curve right at the beginning and that you would uh, not take into account using the tail fit. Normally we do use like the reconvolution fit to take the instrument response function or like in this case, uh, the calculated instrument response function into account. And uh, again, I started with one lifetime decay And then I add another one. And then you see that you do have here a very flat, flat line of the chi-square residuals. So, yeah. Then like we do, fit now the decays of like each frame and, and like each region of interest. And then we will have a look uh, at the data to get directly, let's say, in, yeah, information about the changes over, over time. So what you can also do is you can export all the parameter. And at the beginning, you see here, these, uh, that's all zero, zero, zero. And this is like, uh, that, that is like the complete image, but not the region of interest. And because we just fitted the region of interest, we do get only values and fitted values for the region of interest. And you can export that as an ASCII uh, format and then import that in, in Excel or whatever. Yeah, now just like choose the parameter that you are interested in. And I'm now interested in the um, intensity weighted lifetime. So and how can I get now rid of this one? No. Yeah, and, and here you see that we do have like a dramatic increase in the lifetime yeah, from of, of roughly like 10%. So 3.68, 3.7 was like the lifetime before we added the ammonium chloride. And after adding it, we are like at four, 4.1 nanoseconds. And then that is like this yeah, dramatic change in lifetime by increasing the the pH pH value of the cell. Um, and I 
think I now changed also play a little bit here with the lifetime histogram. Let's see. Exactly. Now when you have a look, so yeah, one, two, three, four are all the same, and here then five, six, seven. We do have then this shift of the complete histogram to uh, the longer lifetime range. Yeah, that is like uh, basically the analysis procedure of, uh, let's say, a time lapse experiment. Um, so, uh, chat. How can I... so, there are quite a few questions coming in, Fabian. Yes. Okay, in case cells move a lot, is there a way to stabilize it? Is it compat compatible with analysis? I mean, you can't really stabilize the cells or prevent them from moving. I would say uh, we already uh, covered uh, the, this, the cover slips with, with polyelicine just to prevent uh, the, the cells from washing away when I add something during the measurement, uh, but they still move. Uh, so, but um, if you don't do it like Fabian did now, but, but uh, set an intensity threshold, it doesn't really matter if they move or not. So then everything which is above a certain threshold uh, should be uh, included into analysis. That, that's my way to do it if the cells move uh, around a lot. I don't know if you have any other suggestions, Fabian. Um, no, I, I would do exactly the same. Yeah, so when you, when you see already in the image that the cells are like moving, um, uh, since we do not have something like, like particle tracking, um, I would use either the sh thresholding, um, let's say here based on, I don't know, here I didn't do that. Um, before, uh, we could either threshold um, the image by intensity or by lifetime. And if you have, for example, like a rather long lifetime, you can get rid of all the short lifetime, which like you do not expect um, to have some kind of time gating. Um, so yeah, that, that would be also my recommendation. So then there's a question regarding the IRF. This morning we saw the impact of the measured IRF versus calculated one. Which method do you recommend? Um, so I would, I think that is also definitely covered on tomorrow. No, not tomorrow, on Friday. Um, so normally the instrument response function is already quite good. Uh, calculated by the by the system. Uh, nevertheless, if you do expect minor fret changes, yeah, uh, in the lower percent range, uh, something like I I saw publications and also in my former group we published a paper where we do have like a fret. A significant fret change yeah, of, of like three to five percent. Um, and, and like, yeah, normally in the cells, and then what I had in my data, I was very, very, very happy when I had like 20 percent in, in a um, protein in a hetero fret uh, interaction where we're like two proteins intact with each other, two different ones. Um, so when you do expect, or when you do have very low changes, I would go for the uh, measured instrument response function. Uh, because this is like really taking the full system. Yeah, then you, yeah, measured the instrument response function, then you know exactly what it is. And uh, this is what you want to know when you do have minor or, or only low changes in the lifetime due to, for example, fret. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And uh, another question is, in what condition recommend to use reconvolution fit model or tail fits? Uh, normally I would, like for quantitative imaging, I would always go for reconvolution. 
Yeah. Um, also, they're like, uh, yeah, tail fits. Um, yeah, I would only go for maybe when you uh, want to separate maybe, yeah, tissue types. But I, I also, I always, always went for reconvolution, actually. Um, I guess if you have a quite long lifetimes, the tail fit might be yeah. appropriate, but but for short lifetimes, I've also always used the convolution. Yeah, and, and short lifetimes, like the normal lifetimes of the fluorophores that you use. I mean, when you do have like fluorophores in the upper nanosecond range, and so like 15, 20 nanoseconds and above, so that you go already into the uh, phosphorescence yeah, or no, not really, but uh, uh, when you go, when you have like yeah, tens of nanoseconds lifetime, then maybe uh, tail fitting might be enough. But yeah, everything what is like what you usually use, I would go for reconvolution fits. Um, because um, it has also like the advantage, and, and this I can show you uh, in my next uh, small example that I have. Uh, it also shows you some advantages when you do have like very high um, laser repetition rate, like 80 megahertz, but uh, also like a little longer lifetime of the fluorophore. Uh, because, and then that you will also, and I'm not sure if maybe, maybe, maybe Steffi mentioned this morning. Uh, normally, what is recommended is that the lifetime, that the observed lifetime, Wait, no, that, uh, that the time window between two pulses, and this is like time window here in this case between two pulses, uh, maybe I can, so okay, uh, is 37 nanoseconds. And so in this case, like the, uh, and then this is why this repetition rate is actually like optimal. So uh, it's like 38 nanoseconds we do have between two laser pulses. And in this case, we do have like a lifetime of the, of the fluorophore of around 3.7 to 4 nanoseconds. So the time window between two pulses is roughly 10 times longer than the lifetime of the fluorophore. So that is normally like the rule of thumb. Yeah? To get like an optimum or the, the perfect lifetime information. Um, the rule of thumb is that the lifetime, or that the time window between two pulses is like 10 times longer than the lifetime of the fluorophore. But uh, one possibility is to um, increase the repetition rate by adding another fitting parameter to the uh, fitting curve, uh, to, the, to the fitting curve, uh, to, to the decay. Yeah, so, and this is called like cyclic excitation, it means that we can, so when you do shorten the lifetime, uh, the repetition rate, it might be that this decay, yeah, does not have the time to go back to background level. I mean, as you see here, at the end of the decay, we do have like exactly the same contract at, at before actually the uh, the laser pulse, and this is like just background noise of the detector. So um, when you now imagine that you have like that you double your uh, repetition rate, so the time window is just eighteen. Uh, nanoseconds between two laser pulses, then you see here directly that the decay does not have the time to go back to the background level yeah, because it stops here and then you would go get the next laser pulse. And this might lead uh, to miscalculation of uh, the true lifetime. But there are mathematical models where we can like wrap around once this lifetime decay through the complete time window. 
And this is called cyclic excitation. So that allows you to double the repetition rate by the same uh, uh, yeah, quantitative uh, fitting process, let's say. And this is in particular important when you do use an 80 megahertz laser, a yeah, multi-photon laser, white light laser, then this uh, fitting model is, is quite important. And this I want to show you um, now, let's see, so. And, and this is like from uh, uh, one other cooperation partner uh, from the group of um, uh, Christina Rose from uh, the neurobiology in Düsseldorf. They made some rapid film experiments with calcium imaging. And there we had like, especially for them, we developed one um, fitting module, which is called multi-frame batch analysis. So what they did is they acquired continuously lifetime images. And here I measured the IRF or take the measured IRF into account. And what, I, what you see here directly, for example, here, we use an 80 megahertz laser 12.5 nanoseconds. And what you see here is that the decay actually is going down still. Yeah, so that means it, we did not have the chance or we did not allow the decay to go back to background level. And that's why we do have actually like here a little bleed through of the, of the lifetime decay. So, and what I do now is I select uh, four regions of interest, or first I like bin um, five frames together to get like at least a certain number of photons, yeah? because also here we had like uh, a quite high uh, frame rate. And this is what I mentioned also uh, at the uh, talk from, uh, from Insta at the discussion that at the end, it's like the limiting factor is now the, the biological sample and even for calcium imaging. So what I do now is on the one side, I uh, get rid of you know, all these dark uh, fields, yeah, dark, dark counts, let's say, um, just by, um, yeah, applying a region of interest or but just by applying an, an intensity threshold, but I could also do it, uh, could also uh, apply a lifetime threshold. There's a question coming in, which floor for was it for calcium imaging? Can you repeat? Uh, yeah, that was the, uh, oh my gosh, um, it's like the conventional, uh, I can double check that. Whoa, nice. Do you have also this cool 3D animation now? Yes. Okay. Um, so, okay, so we do have uh, Oregon Green uh, Bapta. Bap we used for calcium imaging. Yeah, and we had like a peak count rate of more than 20 mega counts per second and uh, a frame rate of five frames per second. So actually now every frame corresponds to one second yeah, because I binned five frames. So beside like threat, setting one uh, intensity threshold, I also want to set, uh, okay, in uh, region of interest. Uh, 
so therefore like I select uh, one overall image and then four cells. And, and since like I'm not interested really like in, in the fit of one pixel, um, I'm more interested in the lifetime of this complete cell. Yeah, I do not care that much about the rule of having a um, thousand photons in the brightest, brightest pixel yeah, because I do at the end not fit uh, the, the image I'm interested in the lifetime decay of one cell as an as a sum. Let's say. So now you see my uh, measured IRF and the decay um, are matching very very nicely. We do have a chi square of 1.0. The residuals are equally distributed, and now I just select uh, a folder for the for the images and um, yeah now I want to yeah save my results and then the software is automatically fitting every region of interest and um, every frame. So in principle, what it does here is, you know, I do have now 240 entries and yeah, 240 images that are fitted. And I do have in total five regions of interest. And yeah, so this is one, two, three, four, five. And for each, I do get like this uh, result file. And although you see here like 30 minutes, you also see that it uh, drops quite quite fast. So what, what the software is doing now it performs more than a thousand fits, um, actually a thousand two hundred uh, fits of, of region of interest uh, within yeah like like yeah fifteen minutes, let's say. And I can just like now go through this and then dim, 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 dim. Which kind of cells are these? Do you know, Fabian? Yes, uh, these are hex cells. Heck 293T. Actually, like, uh, I hate those cells because every time when I wash those, I mean, that what you did uh, today with Astrid, that with hex cells. Oh, this was Hila. Yeah, yeah, but what if you would do that with hex cells, it would be a nightmare because, like, when you flush them twice with uh, washing buffer and yeah. then at the ammonium chloride, they were just. That's just why. Gone. That's why we covered the cover slips with polyallicin. Uh, so I've oh. done a lot of experiments similar to this with hexas. It actually mm -hmm. works very well if you, if 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 they go on poly polyallicin uh, covered uh, uh, right. cover slips. Okay. But I agree, hexas uh, like to detach. <laughs> <laughs> So. Okay, now we can export all entries like as an ASCII again, but you can also generate these uh, parameter plot, which I also showed before, of these like yeah, 240 uh, entries or frames.
and and like this kind of kind of uh, acquisition yeah, and also what what Astrid is doing and um, also the uh, Karsten Krasov that was all not possible with the classical TCSPC electronic. The acquisition time would just take too long, especially when you want to have like this fast changes in the lifetime. Yeah, you would only be able to see uh, the lifetime before uh, apply any mechanical stimulation and a few uh, and a minute afterwards. But this uh, increase, uh, this the spot in between, for example, here, uh, you would not be able to see. And then especially this like is then might then be important for uh, calibrating your system, for example. Question, could you plot different entities from different images as well, or should it be from the same time series? Um, it should be from, in our software, it is always the same time series. Yeah, but, but uh, you can export both and then plot it against each other or sum it up or uh, get the uh, arrow between different images in then uh, R, MATLAB, or Excel. Yeah, would you also get then directly by saving this as, a, as the batch result? No, I just save it uh, as an ASCII file. Uh, You also do have then the, <laughs> yeah, all images uh, there to again generate the video of the data, for example. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that are like actually basically the, the two um, environmental sensing uh, experiments that I wanted to, to show you and to, to demonstrate to you uh, together with Astrid um, to, yeah, to, to like say that fast processes um, yeah, are now able to, to be detected with FLIM uh, also, and um, yeah, that it was basically also from my side. What we could mm. do uh, again is to uh, measure an IRF. I mean, we have seen this this morning by Stephanie, will be probably similar. In our case, I would use another, um, another die course, uh, we use uh, 440 uh, nanometer for, uh, for excitation, so I was, would not use aerosolcine B, but flocine instead, but uh, it's also a uh, quench with chyme iodide, so yeah. But I saw a hand raised by Thomas. Yeah, that was, that was applause. That was... Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, seeing the IRF, oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seeing the, the IRF uh, from fluorescine or erythrocene B um, is in principle, yeah, the same. Uh, fluorescine you use when you do excite with like a bluish uh, laser, erythrocene B you can use with the yeah, 485, uh, 520, 530. That's like a quite broad excitation spectrum. And um, yeah, basically at the end it is uh, the same. Good. Yeah, I mean, um, I hope that you guys all joined like the, the in-depth analysis on Friday, definitely. Uh, there will be like, yeah, will be 
I think it is one and a half hours, Stefan, or is it two hours even? I'm not sure of. I don't like, quite remember. I, I, fun fun, fun with, with data analysis is like the topic. <laughs> um, where PicoQuant and also uh, the people from Leica. Yeah. It's, it's 90 minutes, yeah. Yeah, 90 minutes, yeah. We'll show you uh, how to analyze lifetime data in depth with like, yeah which kind of fitting is important, where you do need like to take care of mm -hmm. difference, flim, flim fret. And um, yeah, like I will take care of phaser. Yeah. So um, I'm having actually two questions. Uh, one for Fabian and one for Astrid. And Fabian, yours is a yes and no question. So I start with that. Um, <laughs> is the, uh, do you sell the software without a microscope? I mean, the analyzer software? Yes. So that would be an option just in case somebody is not happy with the um, analyzed software they have. And we have seen that it's quite powerful. So that's uh, a nice answer. Thank you. I mean, uh, at the end, it is um, depending if you can like import your data in our yes. software saving PTU data. Um, and uh, also, like the other way around, like if you are not happy with the anal analysis, features from our software, for example, there are also like uh, open source, uh, even like image J plugins available that can read uh, PTU data uh, formats or um, demo codes, MATLAB, uh, like uh, the guys from uh, Carsten Krasov, they, they analyze also the data in their own, uh, I think it is MATLAB or Python script. Um, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> oh, here goes the other question. Um, Astrid, at the very beginning, you said that um, the life, uh, maybe I did, it, did get it wrong, but what I, under, what I understood was that in, in some circumstances, the lifetime of the dye depends on the excitation wavelength. Did I get that right? Uh, no, not the lifetime, but uh, um, the... Uh stability also um so what, what 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 we see in our hands if we excite this 488 nanometer which is well outside the excitation optimum mm -hmm. uh that we get less bleaching and uh ah. that we get more specific staining even if of the lysosome less background i don't really uh i still don't understand uh, really why this is it's just not what we observe and that's why uh, we uh for for the classical imaging not for the fluorescence lifetime imaging but for the classical imaging we always try to dispose of the wavelengths 458 nanometers and 488 nanometers, which we had on, on our classical confocal microscope. Mm -hmm. And in, in our hands, this 488 nanometer excitation, we get got a bit 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 better results. Okay, but the lifetime would not change depending on which point. No, you use. no. Okay, that's that's reassuring because uh, yeah. my, my total theory of fluorescence that I have in my head was just crumbling when you said that. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, there was one question coming up by Lucas. Is the IRF just depending on the excitation wavelength or also on the emission wavelength? Uh, the IRF is definitely depending on the excitation laser. It is depending on like the electrical power of the laser, as I mentioned. If you go to 100%, the pulse is broader. Um, going to... I mean, if you, if you want to place the IRF solution under that, we can directly show the impact of that, Astrid. Um, um, we can, uh, yes. I mean, if, if that is like straightforward, I, we can directly demonstrate that. Yeah. Um, Just um, and give me what, a second. Um, and and beside excitation laser and laser power or electrical power, also the type of detectors is is a main um has a main influence on the instrument response factor because also that the time resolution of the detector uh, plays a big role for the instrument response function um maybe i can just ask my questions it would be easier can you hear me yes yes oh, perfect so basically i use two fluorophores which can be excited at 445 which mm -hmm. is a blue one and an orange one with a low, uh, long stoke shift. Mm -hmm. And I was just interested if, if I would like to measure the IRF, would I need to measure two 
or is it uh, would be enough to measure one? No. You do use uh, the same same detector type, right? Yeah. Ideally, both detectors should have like the same time resolution, so you would only need to measure once the IRF. Nevertheless, um, I would just also compare it. If you see that there is no influence on maybe like, uh, because also like the length between uh, the beam from one detector and, and um, I think the length between two detectors are also different. Like in the, from the beam for itself. Um, yeah, I would just like test it. And if you see, okay, good, that is no influence at all, skip it. Just trying to find the right focus before I share the screen again. Uh, let's see this. Okay. Okay, I'll start screen sharing then again. Just yeah, I can take over then. Uh, where's the screen? That's the zoom. That's the zoom. Okay. I mean, are, are you doing it or shall I do it? Yeah, I can, I can do it. I can okay. Do it. So let's say was like the smallest was 86, right? So. Uh, you have to change the demo here again, I guess, in the size of fair. Uh, let's say best. And group, I just named my ref. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just stop it after a certain time. And that's then fine. We can, yeah, work here with 27, since we do not want to change. Fabian, filter change, please. Or shall I do it? Yeah, you, you do it. Yeah, you uh, set up like just the... So, now... Ah, okay, yeah. I guess we will have much to high power now. Take off the... Let's see. Um, yeah, on, the uh, on channel two, we have a lot, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I tried to just try to take, take the channel two off, but for some reason, yeah, now it's off. Now you can just take channel one. <laughs> Okay, are we in focus? Because it seems uh, like that we... Maybe it's changed again. So the problem is that we are at 37 degree and it's quickly evaporating. Maybe I should add some more. Oh yeah, that, yeah, that might be the case. Just, can you stop the measurement for a second? Yes. Mm-hmm. Check for the focus again. So what I would do to check for the focus is to go back to the confocal thing. Okay, yeah, right. I... Continuous. Um, Wait, I just have to stop the mission. Yeah. Did you, I, I don't know. 
think like so we have something but it's not too much green what we get. Okay. Oops. Take over again. Yeah, then I just like start the measurement now. Let's go. quite low. Oh, it's not, there's nothing. Yeah. So, oh, there, yeah, there are dark, just dark counts. Let's see. Shall we go for detector two again or shall yeah. I? I have another solution. Oh, no, it, no, it is, then. yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay, good. No, here we do. And then keep it, I just, just let it run. I have a more concentrated solution as well, I can add. Oh, yeah, then just... Can you stop it again? Yeah, then, yeah. then just add it quickly. Okay, try again. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's better. That's better, okay, good. So, stop measurement. Ooh, yeah. So. So I just, that's enough, let's say. Then we go to 100%. You saw, but you see now already that this IRF is way broader than the IRF before. Uh, so I can stop that. Maybe this one. I want to delete that one. Calculate decay. Now I just take care of the part that I'm interested in. Calculate decay. Okay, now to have a look really how broad the IRF is. I set it linearly and 0 0.9 is now the intensity maximum, half width 0 0.45, show the data reader 0 0.45, we do have 1.99, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.45, 0.
and going to 2.23. So we do have like 230 picoseconds is like the instrument's response function full width half maximum at best pulse. And when I now have a look at the high power, so 230 picoseconds. Again, just get rid of everything what I do not want. Calculate decay. Linear. So one point, uh, let's go. So at the top, 1.07, 0 0.53. So it's like here. There we have 1.86 and 2.23, 1 1.86, 2 2.2, no, 2.3. So there we are like at 400. 60, 460 picoseconds. So we doubled the uh, instrument response function, the full width half maximum, let's say. So and that's like the, the effect of changing the electrical laser power uh, of, uh, yeah, changing the electrical laser power. So it is, it has a dramatic effect of the instrument response function from the complete setup. Um, yeah, what die are we using? Fluorescein. So is that a general feature? The more power you put into the laser, the broader it gets? Electrical power, yes, yes, so yes. So I would it would be a good idea to find a way where you can have the minimum electrical power and then 100% optical pathway in the microscope itself. Yeah, so it, that's why we're like, that's why uh, at Astrid's uh, Tanner's, uh, for example, system, we do set the power to like the best pulse shape uh, to get like the best uh, performance of the system in terms of. Uh, timing resolution, uh, but if you need more power, you can do also, you can also use like a broader pulse. Um, but I think that that must be, or no, no, I'm not sure, I cannot say must be, but I think like changing uh, the power of a, of a white light laser or, uh, or of a femtosecond laser in general should also broaden the pulse shape, but actually I'm not 100% sure on that. I know for picosecond laser, that is the case for femtosecond laser. I assume that it is also the case, but I'm not sure. Femtosecond laser is probably the instrument response function rather depends on the, uh, the oh, yeah, exactly. electronics. Yeah, 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 exactly. For, yeah, might be, yeah, depends mostly on the detector uh, time resolution and the electronics. Okay, um, any more questions? Can I have another question? It's not so much related. Yes. Um, is it correct that if now I use 40 megahertz uh, later instead of 20 megahertz, I can shorten half of the time to collect a certain amount of photon? For example, I need 1000 photon. And if now I use 40 megahertz, I can collect in half the time compared to 20 megahertz? At least you have like uh, double the laser power. So um, roughly, you should 
shorten the acquisition time by a factor of two, but you will have like yeah, bleaching effects or whatever. So it will be not exactly two, but mm -hmm. yeah, it will shorten the acquisition time. Yes. And is this recommend to, to you higher, I know depend on the lifetime of the molecule, but is this, if it's allowed, it's recommend to use the higher um, power laser instead of shorter one? Yeah, it depends on, on bleaching effects of the sample, for example. Yeah, so. Uh, I mean, for me, it's lower, like, really lower. like the fixed sample. So of the fixed dye, which is quite less in bleaching, I would say. Okay, yeah, then go for 40 megahertz. Okay. Um, depend, yeah, if, if the lifetime is okay. For that, so 40 megahertz, for example, yeah, everything like like GFP, for example, is perfectly fine. YFP is also okay. Yeah, thanks. To acquire will be difficult. Uh, that is now then having something like four nanoseconds, 3.8, uh, then it's getting difficult. Yes. Um, okay, um, yeah, Stefan, I think, or Ali, we are like ready, finished. Asta, do you have any, any last words? <laughs> No, not <laughs> thanks not for really. attending and yeah, joining. Thanks, joining. Thanks, thanks for uh, um, staying to the end uh, in the in the in the evening. <laughs> yeah, and uh, in case you have any any uh, queries uh, uh, which we can solve for you, just contact me. Exactly. Yeah, any any you. further questions or whatever regarding lifetime analysis that are not answered on Friday, just get in contact. Interesting samples. <laughs> Send them over to you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are, we are actually we are, we are looking for a cooperation partner, so we are happy to take your samples uh, and, and try try out if we can can solve problems. <laughs> okay, then thank you very much, also from my side. That was pretty interesting. I'm getting some in depth information here. Um, anybody else who wants to say a few words? Maybe Ali, Thomas, your daughter. No, just thank you. Fabian and Asit. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, thanks for, for letting us uh, join this uh, film symposium. I think it's really great from, from Gerby that, uh, and from the course that you uh, yeah, set up this film symposium. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Thank you. So, um, see many of you probably again tomorrow. Um, otherwise, have a nice, whatever time of the day yeah. it is at your place. Uh, <laughs> here in Germany.